thank you very much and thank you everyone for joining this morning very 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 good morning to everyone and as a sunny sunday may god bless you for joining us this morning okay so today what we want to see is uh, entering into a personal covenant uh, with god so we want to understand what it is to have a personal covenant with God. This book, the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, is uh, called um, the New Testament and the Old Testament, or uh, the New Covenant and the Old Covenant. So it is uh, a covenant. What you see in this book, from Genesis to Revelation, is uh, mainly a general uh, promise, a general covenant made to every born again believer. So those 6,000 plus promises that are in this book are uh, made to every believer. But there are uh, conditions to meet for us to receive uh, some of those uh, promises. On top of uh, this, those uh, general promises or general covenants made with uh, every believer from Genesis to Revelation, for every believer to Genesis uh, to Revelation, there are also personal uh, covenants that God cut with uh, individuals and uh, with individuals and with churches, with individuals and with churches. And we need to be aware of those things and uh, we need to know how to initiate those personal covenants. Sometimes God initiates those covenants. Sometimes it's man who initiates those uh, covenants. But which, which, whichever way the covenant is uh, initiated, at the end, uh, there are some uh, promises that God makes to an individual and to a whole family as well. Uh, God also can cut a covenant with a family. Uh, God can cut a covenant with a whole nation. So that covenant is only for that nation, like the nation of Israel, God has a covenant with them. Uh, the nation of Great Britain as well, God has a covenant with the forefathers. They prayed some prayers that were recorded. And uh, God, even after they are gone, God watches over those uh, prayers and see to it that the prayers were not in vain. And God will see to it that what they prayed and God approved of, he will uh, bring it to pass in the name of Jesus. So what we want is uh, to discover to, uh, this morning how to enter into a personal covenant uh, with God. God cuts personal covenants with individuals. And uh, the first scripture reading is taken from uh, the book of Psalm chapter 89 verse 34 to verse 35 uh, psalm 89 verse 34 to verse uh, 35 he says uh, my covenant i will not break so god is saying my covenant god does not break his covenant until we break our part of the covenant every covenant is always conditional uh Every alliance that we have with uh, God as well is always uh, conditional. So if we don't meet our part, then we can, uh, just like when you have a contract with your employer, even now, if, if it is a permanent employment, if you have gross misconduct, they can terminate your permanent employment. The same thing as well. When God says forever, uh, you still have uh, some conditions that you should not uh, a break otherwise it is going to be gross misconduct and then god would break his covenant though he said forever and we are going to see all those things and because when people hear god says forever then they think that it is uh, they can live anyhow the same thing with uh, christianity once are saved and not always saved salvation is available to everyone so you need to repent of your sins give your life uh, to jesus and turn away from your wicked ways then you are born again the blood of jesus washes away all your sins okay and then he says to you no fornicator no adulterers no homosexual no covetous no murderer i don't know drunkard uh would and 
enter uh, the kingdom of God. So let everyone that names the name of Jesus depart from iniquity. If you continue in those sins, you are deceived. Uh, you are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. So though you have received as a lasting life, but your name can be blotted out from the book of heaven. Though you have received as a lasting life, it is he that endures till the end that shall be saved. So even with uh, the first promise of us being born again, it is not uh, a path to go and live anyhow. And if a Christian has that kind of understanding, well, I'm so sorry for that kind of Christian. Uh, you will not see God move in his life. Pursue peace with all men, Hebrews chapter four, uh, 12, verse 14. Pursue peace with all men and holiness without which no one would see the Lord. So holiness, before even we talk about uh, entering uh, into a personal covenant with God, we need to start with the ABCs, holiness unto the Lord, departing from iniquity. If uh, you and I are still practicing unrighteousness, this is not for us. Because that's the basic of Christianity needs to be first of all established in our life. Unfortunately, in the church, which I don't like and which I will not do, we always preach at the level of the last convert. So every day is about repent of your sin, repent of your sin, repent of your sin. So people stay in the same church and it is always uh, the same message because a group of people have not departed from the sin. So they are hindering the spiritual growth of the majority that have departed from the sin. So what do we do? We decide to move on in the name of Jesus. Uh, I would walk at your pace. If you are crawling, I would crawl with you. If you are uh, going on your fours, I will go on, on your four. Like I've explained the Bible study, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, perfect redemption plan three. So if you're on your four, I would go on your four with you. If you are trying now to stand just like the father would uh, grab the child by the two hands and try to make his first step so that he will stop crawling. But now he's now, I'll just stop going on his four. He's now trying to make one foot in front of the other. I would go with you that way as well. If you start to walk by yourself, I would walk with you as well. If you start to run, I would run with you. But if you decide to sit, I'm not sitting with you. God is always on the move. Go, 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 go. So the same thing as well in the church. We would always teach to cause everybody to grow. Not because of a certain group of people, then we would punish everybody to keep on always staying on the, in our spiritual diapers. When I came to church, the first time, uh, after about a month, there was a conference uh, that the general here came at the church. Um, and they were, he was teaching, the, it was for leaders. The pastor said to me, you need to come. So I did not understand the 90% of the things that were said there. But... Because the aim was to make disciples, it really did not matter if I understood or I did not understand. The aim is to make disciples. And uh, with time, I would, they would break down the things uh, uh, to me, and then I would be able to understand what was uh, said uh, during that leadership conference and so on and so forth. But the truth is God wants to raise the leaders out of all of us. And uh, we should not punish some people that want to go forward because of a minority that uh, still want to stay in the scenes. So this making a personal covenant with God is first of all, when we have established uh, the basics, holiness unto the Lord, holiness unto the Lord. Let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. That is uh, the basics. Without uh, holiness, Hebrews 12 or 14, and no one would see the Lord. No one will see the Lord moving in their life. And ultimately also, when we get at the gate of heaven, he will say to us, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. So my prayer is that we would put our life in order. Now, today, back to what I was saying. Uh, and truly, don't, 
don't be afraid. When Sister Louise came, I, I think I don't know why I'm saying that, but the Lord wanted me to say that. When Sister Louise came to, to, to Christ, she only knew the Jesus of uh, Christmas. Uh, Christmas Day, she would go to the Catholic Church with uh, because her children were going to a Catholic. She was not even a Catholic, but her children were going to a Catholic school. So she had uh, it was mandatory for her to attend at least the uh, Christmas Mass, the Easter or Passover, the, for Christians, the Passover Mass. I think they had the free free celeb uh, services in the year that uh, was compulsory for her to attend. She was not a Christian, though the children were going to the Catholic uh, school. She did not know anything about the Bible. She did not, apart from Mary Joseph and Angel Gabriel that she heard uh, during that the Christmas uh, manger scene, she did not know anything about uh, the Bible at all. She did not know Abraham, she did not know Isaac, she did not know Noah, she did not know Job. In fact, I want to say to talk about Job. She thought uh, uh, there was a book in the Bible uh, how to find a job, you know. <laughs> so we laugh about it now. But she was clueless about the Bible. So the first time I talked to her, she, five years later, she testified that she did not understand 90% of what I said to her, but that's okay. So I had to break down over time who is Job, who is a roof who is uh, Abraham, who is Isaac, and so on and so forth. So, but as long as people have um, committed to become disciples of Jesus, not fly by Christian, it really does not matter. As they continue to sit at the feet of Jesus, listening to the word of God, going through the Bible studies, then uh, they will know everything. Then she's the one who corrected the, all the Bible studies, the Mariclan milk, and uh, edited them, and then Lynn and Calvin came and uh, recorded them and published them. So today, Sister Louise, uh, she knows more than uh, the majority of the pastors because she has gone through all those uh, Bible studies, but she only knew in the beginning Mary, Joseph, Jesus, the baby Jesus in the manger, and Angel Gabriel. So I'm not really worried whether you do not understand in depth what I'm going to teach today, but I'm believing that you are going to make a commitment to become a disciple of Jesus. There is no word as a church member in the Bible. Church member does not exist in the Bible. The word in the Bible is disciples. So my prayer is that you are going to be a disciple of Jesus. You are going to sit at his feet and you are going to learn as much as possible that uh, uh, you are going to have also the same fellowship that the apostles had with uh, uh, Jesus. For our fellowship is truly with God the Father, with God the Son, and with God the Holy Ghost. And we also want you to have the same fellowship as John said in 1 uh, John chapter 1. So back now to the covenant. We want to have a personal covenant with God. And people throughout the Bible had a personal covenant with God, and people uh, in the past generations had a personal covenant with God. People that have uh, churches right now have a personal covenant with God. God makes a covenant with individuals, makes covenant with families, makes covenant with uh, churches. The church is always on the shoulders of a person. The church is always on the shoulder of a person. Luke chapter 22, Jesus says, just like my father bestowed a kingdom upon my shoulders, I also bestow a kingdom upon your shoulder. Uh, in the book of uh, Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, Jesus is writing to the seven churches. And he says to the angel of the church that is in Laodicea, the angel of the church of Ephesus, to the angel of the church of uh, uh, Philadelphia, it is not the angel from heaven uh, with uh, wings or without wings. That's not the word that is Malachi, like Malachi in the book of uh, uh, Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi means a messenger. So to the messenger or to the pastor that is uh, that the Lord has entrusted to uh, that congregation there in Philadelphia. This is what uh, Jesus is saying. So whenever you are reading the book of Revelation, 
when you see, when you read it to the messenger, it is to the Malachi. To uh, this is not to, to the angel. Uh, the New King James decided to translate it that Malachi into angel, but it is to the messenger, the one that the Lord has sent to plant that church. This is what the Lord is saying about uh, the church. So Jesus also in Luke chapter 22, he said to his disciples, just like my father bestowed the kingdom upon my shoulder, I also bestow a kingdom upon your shoulder. The kingdom that was bestowed upon the shoulders of uh, Peter was uh, the Jewish uh, church. The kingdom that was bestowed upon uh, the, 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 the shoulders of, um, of Barnabas was uh, the Gentile church, but uh, especially the Asian church. The kingdom that was bestowed upon the shoulders of, uh, of Paul was the, the, um, the Gentile church, but it is West Europe up to Ephesus, Ephesus, which is now Turkey. So that was the kingdom that was bestowed or the sphere of influence that was bestowed upon the shoulders of uh, 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 Paul, the apostle with uh, Silas, who was working with him. So God does a covenant and based on the church that is planting now, God gives uh, uh, Psalm 133, the anointing flows from the head of Aaron, the one that was the high priest or the one that was overseeing, like Peter said, they are watching over your soul, they give account to God. So the anointing based on the promises that God made it to that messenger about the church that is overseeing, the anointing now and the promises would flow from the one that is the messenger or the Malachi or the angel over that church down to the the, the, the beard, the, the, the garment, and the, the, up, the down to the feet. That's how the Lord commands his blessing upon that uh, church. So that's how church truly work. So when people call me, for instance, at the new year, okay, what did God say to, to you? I say to them, it is not for you because you are not in the house of prayer for all nation. It is for those who are, according to Psalm 133, for those who are in the house of prayer for all nations, who in your church where you are, then what is God saying for that year concerning that uh, church? So that's how church functions properly. So back now to the covenant. I would address some personal covenants. I would address some family covenants. And I would address some church covenants that God makes. And then we are going to understand things. And uh, you are going to seek the face of the Lord the marriage covenant as well. And that's what God wants to talk to us today, entering into a personal covenant with God as an individual, as a family, as a church, as a business, and so on and so forth. I will not take all the examples, there are so many of them. So back to our Psalm 89, verse 34 and, and uh, 35, it says, my covenant, so God's covenant that he cut with is uh, that personal individual, that individual, that individual say, my covenant I will not break. God will not break his covenant, nor will I alter the word that has gone out of my lips. God does not break his covenant, neither um, uh, does he alter the word that has gone out of his lips. That is the big problem for Christians. It was also a problem for Father Abraham. Because God said to me, yeah, you are going to have a son. But he was married. So he said, okay, God will not break his covenant. He would give me a son. But God can alter his covenant. Maybe it is not with my wife that is already 80 and 90 years old. Maybe I can take the mistress, uh, Hagar, and have a child. God has still performed the miracle. I still have a son. It is my son, Abraham but not, simply not with my wife, uh, uh, Sarah. Father Abraham believed that God would not break his covenant. Okay, but he can alter the word that has gone out of his lips. And that's how many Christians fall, fall, fall. Not just God will not break his covenant, neither will he alter. And then we make our own Ishmael, like Abraham, that thought that God still has, uh, has given me marriage, that's given me a son. But how did God break 
the covenant of uh, the holy institution of marriage because by you having Ishmael, it means that you've broken the covenant of the holy marriage with uh, Sarah by committing adultery or by you having Ishmael, you have uh, bro broken the holy covenant and profaned it of marriage by being unequally yoked with unbelievers. So God does not just, he doesn't break his covenant, but he also does not alter the words that are gone out of it. In the beginning of my faith, the Lord promised me something. And as, uh, after five years, I said, God, I can't get it the other way. And then he says to me, he said to me back then, not just I don't break my covenant, but I do not also alter the word that has gone out of my lips. And for Father Abraham, it took him 25 years because he kept on making mistakes. And he said, God, come and bless. Before he carried his son, uh, his nephew Lot. God, if I don't have a son, at least uh, my nephew is like my son. He's, the, the, he's all, even an orphan. God said, if you want to adopt, fine. But that's not my word, okay? None in your me shall be barren, nor suffer miscarriage. So if you want to adopt your, the son of your nephew, of your, your nephew, the son of your, your, of your brother that is now late, that's okay. But that's not me fulfilling my word. I will not break my covenant. I say that you and your wife are going to have a child. And then he believed, okay. He sent the Lord away. He delayed. And then he said, okay. If it is a son that you are going to give me directly, not for adoption, then uh, maybe I can have a Hagar and then we would have Ishmael. It is still my blood, not just not adoption. And God was saying, and he said to God, God, come and bless it. I've made my own thing. And many of us, that's what we are doing. We are making our own thing, breaking God's law. And God, just come and bless it. God said, no. I'm not a man that I should lie. Neither am I a son of man that should uh, change my words. Numbers chapter 23, verse 19 and 20. So, and then it took him another 13 years now. Because of the mistake that Abraham made, he kept on postponing the promises of God, the manifestation of the promises of God. And ultimately, God said to him, it is with Sarah, your wife. And even Sarah laughed. But God says, my covenant, I will not break. And I will not alter also the word that has gone out of my lips. He says, once I have sworn by my holiness. God has a sworn by, so whenever I read the Bible, I have another picture. And you need, um, I pray that you would have that uh, picture of God when you are in the Bible, because God swore, but he lifted up his right hand and he swore, just like when you are in a court of law and they ask you to lay your hands on the Bible, your left hand on the Bible, and to raise your right hand and to swear to only say the truth and nothing but the truth, so God help you. So that's also what God says when he gave us his word, his covenant. He, left, he lifted up his right hand in his uh, holiness and he swore by himself because he could not swear by anyone that was greater than he. Like Paul explained in the Hebrews, he swore by himself that my covenant I will not break. Neither will I alter the word that I've gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn in my holiness, and this is now the rest he says, he says what? I will not lie to David. He sworn in his holiness that he will not lie to David. In here, he, he mentioned the, the, the specific covenant that he made with uh, David. But today, if you meet the requirement that David met, God also can make a personal covenant with you. He can also make a personal covenant with you like he made with Abraham. Now, over in Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 20 and 21, Jeremiah chapter 33, verse uh, 20 and 21. He says, that says the Lord, if you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night so that there will be no day and night in the season, then my covenant or, uh, may also be broken with David, my servant, so that I shall not, uh, he shall not have a son to sit on his throne. And the Levites, 
the priest, my minister. So God made a personal covenant in those days with the sons of Levi to give them the priesthood, with the sons of Aaron also to give them, um, uh, how do you call it, uh, to be high priest and all the chief priests, and also made a covenant with David. So God made the whole covenant with the family of Aaron and then with uh, the brethren, the Levi, to give them the priesthood. He made also a covenant, a personal covenant with David that he would always have uh, a son that sits on the throne forever. And if you can stop his covenant, uh, break his covenant with the day and the night, that uh, there will be no more days, that the sun will never come out, the moon will never come out and, uh, in the night and the, uh, the stars, then you can break his covenant with David. In other words, you can never, never break his covenant with David and with his Levi. He swore by himself. Now, how did David initiate that covenant with God? How? We want to know how David initiated that covenant with God so that we also can initiate a personal covenant with God, that there will be a difference between Christian and Christians. So how come God loves you so much and made so many promises about, <laughs> to you? Are we not all Christian? Yes, we are all Christian, but some people have a person, apart from the general covenant that all of us have, some have been able to have a personal covenant with God. So how do we initiate that the personal covenant? Let us learn from David. David initiated that personal covenant. God did not initiate it. David did. And God was so happy and God came. Now, over in the book of Acts, one of the apostles, chapter 13, Paul is telling us about David again, verse 22. And when he had removed him, so he removed the soul, he raised up from them David. As, as king, to whom he also gave testimony. This is the testimony that God gave of David. I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. He will not pick and choose. He would obey me fully, 100%. David was a man that was in love with God. Genuinely, he loved God. Genuinely, he wanted to obey God. He was not trying to find loopholes. What kind of sins can I continue to, to do and then still be a child of God? No. And God from heaven, he saw it. He said, oh, Saul. God said he regretted why he put the soul as a king. Because Saul was more concerned about the opinion of people to please the people than obeying God. And God said to Samuel, I regretted why I put Saul as king over Israel. In the heart of God, David was not even there. For him, it was a King Saul. Saul, God wanted to have a personal covenant with Saul that he would establish his kingdom forever. But Saul kept on messing up, messing up, and God said, I regret. Now, by now, I would have established his kingdom forever. Now I've changed my mind. And then God gave another assignment. He disobeyed again. God said, I have enough. I've, he said to Samuel, I have found the son of Jesse. He's a man after my own heart. He will do all my will. God has been watching you. God also has been watching me. And the God that sees in secret, he rewards you openly. It is not what we do on Sunday or what we do in church that matters to God. It's who we truly are 24-7. And David was minding his own business, but God saw him as a man after his own heart. And God had purpose in his heart that this is the kind of person I want to be king over uh, my people. Now, 
this. So you need to be, you and I need to be genuinely in love with God. We need to serve God genuinely with all of our heart. Now, God will test us to see if our genuineness uh, is a true or fake. And we will go through things and God can say, now I know. Like he said about Father Abraham, now I know that you truly fear me. Just like when you go for an employment, you have that induction period and then they give you uh, probational uh, for a six months. Uh, and then after those six months, then you sign the, the contract for permanent employment. But even with the permanent employment as well, there are some... Uh, things in that contract that if you break them, it may end up into the termination of your permanent employment as well. But nevertheless, you have signed, after you've gone through the induction and the, the probation period, then you can sign that the permanent contract as well. The same thing with God as well, but that, that's what we are talking about now, a covenant that is better than any earthly contract. So David initiated it. God is always looking for a man, a woman, like you say in the book of Ezekiel 22. He's always looking for a man, but he found none. My prayer is he, he, he's going to find you today. And he is going to be able to cut a covenant with you, cut a covenant with your family, cut a covenant with your business. Now, the second thing is uh, you need to do what nobody else has done before. From not because God is commanding you, but because it is coming directly from the bottom of your heart. I say again, you, the second thing, after you initiate uh, uh, that covenant by being a man after God's own heart, a man that is willing to obey all that God uh, wants you to do, like David was willing to, to obey all the will of God, genuinely be in love with God. And then the second thing that is important in so that God can cut a personal covenant with you and with me, is that you need to be willing to do what uh, nobody else has done before. Or to do something that has never crossed the mind of other people. Because many times we just obey God because he told us some commandments. And that's, that's the beginning. That's the beginning of Christian faith, commandment, commandments. But uh, Jesus says to us, a servant that needs to be told everything to, that you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do that, is an unprofitable servant. Basically, he's not achieving more for the kingdom. God wants us to become like, to become his friend, not just like to become his friend. The friend he does those tasks, yes, but he knows the heart of uh, the father and joyfully he takes initiatives, joyfully he suggests things to God, joyfully he does things that uh, the servant is not willing to do. The servant that he has done what the Lord commanded, did him. Okay, I've just done what I was commanded, that's it. But the friend will go the extra mile. Now, in the book of uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, from verse uh, 7 to verse 13, that's when now uh, God uh, came down and cut the covenant uh, with David forever and swore to him that you are always going to have a son that sits on the throne. You've moved my heart like never before. God sometimes wants something done. Hallelujah. But he knows that we only love him because of what he does for us. So he does not expect much of us. Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, he just commands us, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And what is truly in the heart of God, he does not express it because he knows that uh, when we are approaching him, we truly don't have it in mind. We only want our healing, our deliverance, and this, 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 and that. But the friend would tap into something more than just a command. You would ask God, God, what do you want to be done? God, what is in your heart? What would make you happy? And you will see God will start talking. So in that uh, second Samuel chapter seven, 
He says from verse 7 to verse 13, uh, I'll not read everything. He says from verse 7, uh, wherever I have moved, so God is saying, wherever I've moved about with the, all the children of Israel, uh, if I ever spoken a word to anyone from the tribes of uh, Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people, Israel, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David, that says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep to be a ruler over my people, over Israel, and I have been with you wherever you have gone. I have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I have made you a great name, like the name of the great men uh, who are on the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move uh, no more nor shall the sons of the wicked oppress uh, them uh, anymore as previously. Since the time that I commanded the judge, the judge's period lasted 500 years. So Moses, 40 years, Joshua, uh, about 40 years, and then the judge is 500 years, almost 600 years. And uh, uh, sold the first king 40 years of reign. So we are talking about now 604 and 40 years since that time that he brought them out of Egypt. I, uh, since the time that I commanded the judges uh, to be over my, uh, my people Israel and have caused you to rest from all your enemies. Also the Lord tells you that uh, he will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled, verse 12, and uh, you rest with your fathers, I will say to you, I will set up your seed after you, whom, uh, who will come from your body, and I will establish your kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. He will, uh, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So that's what God did. For God had the need. He wanted to be worshipped more uh, in spirit and in truth, to have a temple. Nobody thought of it. The only for God prosper me, God bless me, I will build my own house, and so on and so forth. So David sat down. He won the victories for, for, for the Lord. He defeated the people of, uh, that were tormenting the people of God. He fought all the battle of the Lord, as God said. And when he had some peace, he sat down in his palace. He thought about himself. He said, I'm living in a palace and uh, the house of my God. It's just a ten. Ah, no, 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 no. He was just thinking. God did not speak to him. He, the, the love that he had for his God, he said, I will build my God a house. It will be the best house all over the world. So when God heard it, oh, God was moved. He said, I never even asked in even Moses, I did not ask him to build me a house. If I ever commanded any of those judges, including Moses, I'd led you out of Egypt, never. No, David, you've moved my heart. Now, I gave you, I took you from being a shepherd boy, gave the kingdom to you instead of your, your master's soul. But now, because of that, David, ooh, God sometimes can be excited if you know God. <laughs> he said, David, no, 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 no. I'm going to make you a name. Your name will be great. Not just that. From your own body. A son would always come to sit on the throne of David. 
And later on, even the Messiah will come from David. And Christ Jesus is the son of David. God cut the covenant because David was willing to do what no one else has done before. It, that initiative came from uh, his own heart. It was not a command. All the other commands of the Lord, he observed it. But that one moved God because it came from David himself. Now, we have Jesus who came to fulfill it, and God kept his word, did not break his covenant to David, as we read in Psalm 89 and Jeremiah 33, God did not break his covenant with David, did not alter the word that came out of his, uh, of his lips, he swore by his own holiness, he did not lie to, uh, to David, and it came to pass. Thousands of years later, God kept his word to David. Now, that is a covenant that God can do with a man that is after his own heart, that genuinely loves him, that is excited about uh, advancing the kingdom of God. Now, can we break that covenant? Do God say that covenant is forever? God can make a covenant with you as an individual, with your family, but you can break it by the way we are living, not in holiness. The sons of Eli were living in sexual immoralities. They were sleeping with the women that were coming in the temple. They were taking more money than they were supposed to take uh, uh, in uh, the tithe and offering. Then the Lord said uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30 to verse 32, he says, Therefore, the Lord, the God of Israel says, I said indeed, so God that in the past, God made a covenant with them, that the, your house, the house of Eli, and the house of your father would walk before me forever. According to God's intention and covenant that he cut with uh, Eli, among all the descendants of Aaron that were qualified to be high priest, he chose the family of Eli that uh, he was pleased at the time, he was pleased with that family of Eli that he would only take a high priest now from the family of Eli. Because Phineas, the son of Aaron, had other children by that time, 500 years have gone already since the, the time of the judges. So they had, uh, even the sons of uh, Phineas, they were many of them. And they also had their own families, but he chose now only the family of Eli. He said, oh, I'm so pleased with you, Eli. You moved my heart. I want you and your descendants to always be high priest. I will not choose a high priest from any other family, but your family, Eli. Then the sons of Eli, therefore, because God said forever, it, knew, it gave them a license to act anyhow. That the goodness of the Lord is supposed to lead us to repentance. It is not supposed to lead us into a life of a sin. Otherwise, God will regret the fact that he told us uh, that he would do it forever. He would have a personal covenant with us. So, so they were supposed to walk before him forever. He said, but now the Lord says, far be it from me. God forbid, like Paul said, God forbid in the book of Romans. God forbid, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor them. Those who, your lifestyle either honors God or dishonors God. Honoring God is not just with words. Our actions, they either honor God or they dishonor God. And the actions of the sons of Eli were dishonoring God. So he said, far be from me. God forbid that I should continue to keep a covenant with them, with that family. He says, those who honor me, I will honor and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. He says, behold, the days are coming that I will cut off your arm and the arm of your father's house so that there will be not a man in your house. And you can read verse 32 as well. So those who 
despise the Lord, God will likely esteem them. But those who honor him, he will honor them. David despised the Lord when he was living in sexual immorality with Bathsheba. The Lord came and said to him, why have you despised me? He said, God, I don't despise you. I worship. He said, you despised me by taking the Bathsheba. And because of you, my name is now being profaned all over the place. David repented and God did not break his covenant. But the sons of Eli, they refused to repent. God sent a prophet to Eli, say, correct your children. They need to change. They refused. And God said, I'm going to cut off this house. And the day came in 1 Samuel chapter 4, when they went to war, the two sons of Eli were killed. And his daughter-in-law that was pregnant, she gave birth to the son. The son was called Ichabod. The glory had it departed. Like I said yesterday, the spirit of the Lord will not rest, uh, rest, uh, strive with you forever. He will not strive with you forever. The day will come, the Lord say, I regret. I promise this, 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 this concerning this person, now I regret. Far be it from me. He's not honoring me. I will not also honor him back. He's despising me. I will likely esteem him as well. The glory will depart. Like Samson also, he tried to shake himself. The anointing had departed. The glory had departed. He became Ichabod. And the enemy killed him. So though God said forever, the same thing as well, though we are born again, we receive everlasting life. The way we live either honors God or dishonors him. We either the, the despise him by what we are doing if we are so doing, then you would also likely esteem as his glory also will depart. Solomon started to dishonor God by marrying the pagan wives. God said, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. He multiplied them. But the covenant was not with Solomon, it was with David. So God would always, God wanted to judge, but he said, I have a covenant with David. For this, that's why as you read the book of uh, Kings, God is always saying, for the, for the sake of my servant David, for the sake of, I made a covenant with David. How will I escape from that covenant with David? Is the children, they are now misbehaving. They think that because I said forever with the fathers, that uh, I would continue to do it with them, regardless of the way they are dishonoring me and despising me. By the lifestyle. So as soon as Solomon died, God also, God modified that covenant. He said, okay, I'm taking all my gold, all my silver, and I'm leaving you only with a copper. And God also tore that kingdom in two, only left the two tribes with the sons of David, and ten tribes he gave it to the servant of David. Yet they did not learn the, uh, the, that, that lesson. They continued until God removed them physically from the throne, sent them in deportation in Babylon. And God said, okay, I will no longer keep it physically. I will only keep it spiritually. So Christ Jesus came. He did not sit physically uh, in the throne of David. There was no more kingdom of Israel. But spiritually, the Messiah still came, the King of Kings, the Lord. He's still in heaven, but not in Jerusalem. You're only going to come and sit in Jerusalem at the second coming. God would keep it at the second coming of Jesus. But physically, he said, you children of David, descendants of David, you keep on despising me by your actions. I remove also the kingdom from you. My prayer is that the covenant that God has made with us, we will not destroy it ourselves. And when God gives us warnings, let us heed those warnings. Samuel, uh, so, sorry, Eli refused to heed the, those warnings. And uh, he died as well, himself died as well. As he heard the news of his children being killed, he died as well. I remember the Lord said to me, Jerry, do not despise me like David. He said, if you want, uh, uh, a young wife, I would give you a young wife. If you want an uh, older wife, I would give you an older wife. If you want a black wife, uh, 
uh, red wife, uh, yellow wife, uh, white wife, a mixed race wife, whatever, mix, whatever you would be imagining in your head, whatever you want, I would give it to you. That's what he said to David. Whatever you wanted, I would have given that to you. But why have you despised me? God will give you the desires of your heart and the desires of your eyes. But do not despise God by profaning his whole institution of marriage, by defiling the marriage bed, by being unequally yoked with unbelievers. It breaks God's heart. So uh, I think that was in 2008. It is still in my head. I said to God, I made back the promise to God. I said, God, I will not despise you at all in the name of Jesus. And the day came when uh, my, the one that I, the person that I was engaged to, she fell into sexual sin, and the Lord told me. And then she called me and she said, okay, I've sinned, I forgive her, I prayed for her. And then she said to me, oh, you also can go and commit fornication so that we are equal. I said, you are a foolish woman. My body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. I will not despise God like David despised God by having sexual immorality with uh, Bathsheba. If you want to go, marry this only on earth. If you want to continue to myself and go away, you'll go away. But me, I have made a covenant with my God that I will not despise the Lord the way David already specifically told me, do not despise me the way David despised me. That's why I have a zero tolerance for sexual immorality. Zero in the name of Jesus. Because these are the things that grieve the Holy Ghost. That God made a covenant with the whole family of Eli that they would be high priests forever. God said, I regret. Far be it from me that I will continue those things with them. I will wipe them out and I will find another person. He put to Samuel there to take over. There are things that are important to God. We make light of those things, but they are truly, truly important to God. Now, we will see the personal covenant that uh, God had also with Father Abraham. It starts with obedience. Father Abraham, God spoke to him in the book of Genesis chapter 12, verse uh, 1 and 3. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 and 3 says, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Get out of your country. It starts when you are born again. You leave your people and you have your family. And from your father's house and to a land that I will show you, and I will make your name great, and I will bless you, and I will uh, uh, make your name great, okay? And you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is just like God making you a promise. He has not cast the covenant yet. He is telling you what he wants to do. And that's what also God tells, uh, comes and uh, says. With us. He will show us a vision. He will speak to us. He will give us a word. That's what I want you to be. So I'll, I'm telling you what I want to do, but we need to cut a covenant. But there's a part of obedience that you have to, uh, to have. Like David, the man after God's own heart, who will do all my will. And Abraham also was willing to do all the will of God, leave everything and go to the place that the Lord would uh, tell him to do, uh, to go to. And then God would do this, 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 this. As long as Abraham was not willing to, to depart from his country, from his family, from his father's house, God also would not do the other part. If we are willing and obedient, we are going to eat the good of the land. So Father Abraham, decided to act upon it, and he left Ur of the Chaldees. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Sometimes you don't need to fast at all. You just need to obey. Before you fast, to find out what is in this book that God is requiring of you and I to do. And then the second step is now, like in the life of David, you must be willing to do what others have not done before. Not just uh, meeting the, the, the commandment that God is asking uh, for all of us, but also do what uh, 
though uh, man uh, no man else has been able to do before now in the book of genesis chapter 22 after god has given him isaac we can read it from verse 11 to verse 18 but i'll not read it because for the sake of time so after god has given him uh, uh isaac god said to him i want that isaac back god when you have a personal covenant with god God does not want anything else or anyone else to be a God in your heart. And sometimes the ministry that God has given unto us becomes a God in our heart. The church that God has given unto us becomes a small God in our heart. The healing crusade that God has given unto us becomes a, a God in our heart. We must be willing. The, the disciples that God has given into, uh, unto us becomes a small God in our heart. So we are now doing everything to please those people instead of pleasing uh, God. So God would always test everything. He would give you something and you come and collect it. Can you give it back to me? In John chapter 21, Peter and all the others, they went fishing. They cast the net. They caught nothing. And in the morning, Jesus said, children, do you have any fish? They said, nothing. They said, cast your net on the right. Said, when they did, they caught so many fish. But Jesus was at the shore. He was broiling fish. And when they came out, Jesus said to them, give me some of your fish. Sometimes we need to turn over those church, those disciples back to Jesus. And uh, wherever they want to go, we bless them because we are not there to control the life of anyone. And sometimes it can be very difficult. You've fasted, you've prayed for the people, and so on and so on. And they had a breakthrough. Uh, and then you feel that they are going to stand with you. And then they say, oh, they are going away. And then you are heartbroken. You say, why did I spend my time fasting and praying? It was a waste of time. <laughs> God says, surrender them to me. Don't try to control them. Surrender them to me. Give me back my fish. And wherever they will go, just ask them to continue to pray the, to, pray, uh, to pray to God and serve the Lord. Sometimes it can be very painful. Like I told yesterday with the healing crusade, the same God that is doing the, the healing of cancer, deaf ears, and so on and so forth, we did it for one year. And uh, it went from about 20 to almost 200 people. The, the place was packed. We moved into the cathedral so that we, next year we will be in the cathedral because we are just uh, expecting it to grow, 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 and God say, shut it down. God, but people are being healed. Deaf are hearing, mute are speaking, autism is being healed, all the cancers are being healed, and you are telling me to shut it down? God says, shut it down. Which one is more important to you, the healing ministry or a relationship with me? I'm telling you to shut it down. And you need to be able to take back that promise that God gave you, that Isaac of yours, and kill it and burn it and sit down and wait for God to bring it back from the ashes. That's what Father Abraham believed. So what is your Isaac? That God was the one who gave it to you, but now it has become a small God in your heart. The other thing that I had to burn was my, uh, my, uh, my uh, career, because my career was a God into my heart. And uh, <laughs> in those days, I said to God, God, I would even give 20% of my income and I'm not talking about the tithe here, I'm talking about 20% of my income, but I don't want to leave my profession. The Lord said, I'm not after your money because money is not a problem to you. <laughs> You've always been given uh, from your tender age, I know you. Uh, but your, uh, your Isaac is your career. That's what I want. I want you to tie it on the altar kill it and burn it to ashes <laughs> and uh, I said to God no God I will give you 50% of my money <laughs> and I gave 50% because I'm not after your money money is not an idol in your heart this is an idol the idol that I want you to surrender and the day came I walked out of my office and all my colleagues sent me email, nasty email. They insulted me, insulted me, insulted me. <laughs> when I was coming all the way from Glasgow to, to Manchester, 
I, I was always my the, the coach. For some reason, it was always passing in front of my office. So I decided I no longer travel like, during the day because whenever I would pass in front of my office, tears would be coming down my eyes. I said, God, I'm a stupid. Am I making the right choice here? And then I was only now traveling by night. So that when I'm passing in front of that building, I'm not saying it, it is, everything is black. There were now some, uh, some, some streets in uh, Manchester that I did not walk anymore because most of my colleagues, well, they were, uh, I would bump into them if I took that, that street because it was just in the city center. So when I even wanted to go to the city center, I would go through another way just to avoid seeing my previous colleague. And sometimes I would bump in as that with another colleague. He would be telling me all kinds of things, insulting me that you are stupid. Why did you do this and do that? And I would come back home, I would kneel down, I would weep. I say, God, Abraham only killed it for, for three days. <laughs> that means that's more than a year, two, three, four, five, six. What is your Isaac? God knows what is our Isaac. Before he makes a personal covenant with us, he would first of all kill that Isaac. He gave us that Isaac, but it has become an idol. He gave us that ministry, it has become an idol. You would say, give it back to me. Can you trust me with that? He gave us those children. My mom, if we pray to God, God, give us those children. Okay, let me finish with, so that was Genesis chapter 22 from 11 to, to 18. So after Abraham had uh, sacri- uh, lifted up his knife, God said to Abraham, now I know. He says, do not lay your hand, verse 12, don't lay your hand on the lad and do nothing to him for now I know that you fear me. Since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me, there are some prayers you cannot pray. I'll say it again. There are some prayers you cannot pray until you have done exactly what Abraham has done or what the Philippian church has done. That's why God says, come, let us reason together. When I sit down in my, my, my prayer, I'm reasoning with God. I say, God, you asked me to do this. I've done this. You asked me to do this. I've done this. Now, Lord, keep your covenant that you made with your son. And that's how people who are in your covenant, they pray. Because they've done the path. And God swore by himself, because you did this, I will do this, do this, do this, do this. God will stipulate what he's swearing to do on your behalf, on the behalf of the church. And now, as we, uh, we continue that chapter 22 uh, of that uh, Genesis, and, the, and the, verse 15, and the angel of the Lord called, him, uh, called to Abraham the second time. From heaven, he says, by myself, I have sworn. So after you've done the part of the covenant that God was asking you to do, by himself, the Lord has a sworn. And said, uh, says the Lord, because you have done this thing, I have not, and have not withheld your son, your only son. He says, now, blessing, I will bless you. Multiplying, I will multiply you. Uh, multiply your descendants as the stars in the heaven. And as the sand which uh, uh, is on the seashore, and your descendant shall possess the gates of the enemy. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So, chapter 12 of Genesis is stipulated what they wanted to do. Chapter 22, after Abraham had obeyed, then God swore by himself. He made now an everlasting covenant with Abraham. Abraham did his part. That's what we are not teaching to Christians. They think it is blabbing and grabbing. There's no doing part. There's a doing part. We have a part to play. If you do this, I will do that. If you do this, I will do that. And God swore by himself. Because Abraham did it, because Abraham obeyed in the name of Jesus. In the, in, uh, in the, the, if we take the example of marriage, for instance, Ruth the Moabites, in the book of, she was a pagan, hallelujah, 
Ruth was a pagan Moab, Moabites, and uh, she married uh, the son of Naomi, that son died, but she was converted to Christianity now, not to Ju Judaism. Uh, she became a righteous person. She was serving the Lord. So Naomi became a widow as well, and her two sons died. She wanted to go back to her country. So she said to Orpha, go back to your people. She said to, Neo, uh, to Ruth as well, go back. And she said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. In our country, we have many gods. We have Islam. We have uh, the native uh, gods. We have uh, all kinds of uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, and uh, we have uh, many small gods. You can cho choose to go back to those gods because your people serve those gods, because you are so desperate about marriage, because Ophra, the sister-in-law, was so desperate about marriage. I need to go back to my people. I need to go back to my people. But your people are serving a different God. Naomi said, go back like your sister-in-law, go back, but this is what Ruth, but Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people, the Christian for us, shall be my people. And your God, my God. So I've chosen the Christian. I've chosen the God of the Christians for us. Where you die, I will die. And there, uh, there will, uh, sorry, and there will I be buried. And the Lord do so to me. And more also, if anything but death parts you and me. That's what she said to Naomi. Naomi said to her, but you know, I have no other son to marry you. Why are you still continuing that Christianity? I'm not seeing a Christian brother to marry me here. Maybe I need to go back to my people. I know they are serving another God, but at least one of them can marry me. Ophrah went away. Ruth said, I'm not, don't stop saying it again. I'm not leaving. Don't entreat me to go back. I'm staying here. I'm staying here. Be with the people of God. Marriage or no marriage, I've decided to follow Jesus. And these are the kind of vows that move God. And God said, wow. And her testimony was known all over Israel. When she followed her mother-in-law, she abandoned the people, abandoned the, the God of the people to follow the God of Naomi, to embrace the people of Naomi the, for us, the Christian. And God saw it. God also cut a covenant with her. And she finally met Boaz, the great-grandfather of David the great-great-great-grandfather of Jesus. Ruth is now in the Bible. She's now in the divine plan of God because she vowed to God that marriage or no marriage, I will follow you. Your people, the Christian, are going to be my people. God cut the covenant with her that the Messiah will come by you and for you, for your descendant David, the Messiah will come. So I encourage you, sisters and brothers as well, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Even if they are your people, Ruth made that, that the, the, the mother-in-law said, you can go back to your people and to the God of your people. If they are idol worshippers, go back there. But Ruth said, your people are going to be my people. Your God is now my God. Why will I go back to my people? If my people are not Christian, why will I go back there? God will give me 
someone that is a Christian. But even if he does not give me anyone, the mother said, I don't have another son to marry you. And even if I give birth today, will you wait until he's 18 to marry him? No. So go back. These are the kind of things that move God. God wants you to be married. In chapter 3 and chapter 4, God found the rest for Ruth. And God also would find the rest for you. You were born again, believer. And the two of you are going to advance the kingdom. And something great like David, the king, would come out of that union in the name of Jesus. You are going to be in the plan of God. Because you vowed to stay with the people of God, like uh, Ruth said, to forsake our people, if our people are not uh, Christians. Many of my people, they are not Christian at all, for, after the flesh. When I talk to them, they are not, according to the Bible, they are not Christians. According to the Bible, they are not Christians, because the way they are living is not Christianity that I know. So will I just marry them because they are from my, my, my country? God forbid. My allegiance is first of all to this book and to the God of this book. Who is my brother? Jesus said, who is my sister? My brother and my sister is not the one that is black like me. My brother and my sister is not the one that is from my country. My, bro my brother and my sister is not the one that uh, we have the same uh, blood relationship. No. My brother, Jesus says, and my sister, my mother, my father, is everyone who does the will of my father in heaven. That is my brother. That is my mother. So let us renew our mind when we are uh, Christians. God cut a covenant with Ruth. The same thing as well. We are looking for a child. In the book of 1 Samuel, uh, from now on, I will just paraphrase it for the sake of time. In the book of uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1 from 9 to 17, God also came. Hannah was barren. Why do you want to have a child? Is it that so that the people can say that I also have a child? If the only reason why you want to have a child is so that people can say also you are not a barren, God is not interested. But if you want to give that child to God, to serve him. And God is interested. So Hannah came in 1 Samuel chapter 9 from uh, from chapter 1 from 9 to 17. She poured out her heart at Shiloh. She cried out unto the Lord, Lord, if you give me, she made a vow to God, if you give me a son, I would give him back to you. The Bible says, give and it shall be given. You can never have to give God. Abraham gave his son to God. He was willing to to kill him and uh, cremate him. And God gave him a descendant as, the, as numerous as the stars in the sky. Whatever you give, God will multiply. He will more. You can never outgive God. Give and shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. So shall God give back into your bosom. And Eli said to her, Go home. Your petition has been answered. She poured out her heart. And when the son was uh, born, she waited the one the son was wind, four and a half year old, according to the Jewish culture, and she brought back that son. She dedicated that son as a Nazarite to God. And God took it. She initiated the covenant with God. And God took it. Took uh, Samuel, but God would always out to give you. And the Bible says in that first Samuel chapter 2, verse 21, first Samuel chapter 2, verse 21, God gave to, Anna, to, to Hannah three more sons and two more daughters. So after Samuel, she had three more sons and two more daughters. So altogether, she gave birth to six children to her husband. The one that was barren, and vow to God, God, if you give me at least a son, I will give it back to you. God opened her womb, gave her one that will be his, and gave her five others in the name of Jesus. She had a personal covenant with God. And God made, and that the son was not just any son, he became the judge over Israel. God removed Eli, 
and the sons that were despising him, that were not honoring him, and he replaced the son of the vow of Hannah. She had a personal covenant with God. Solomon as well had a personal covenant with God. In the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 1, from verses 6 to verse 12, I'm not going to read it, I'm going to paraphrase it for the sake of time. To be a king, no, let's go back to, to Hannah first with the children. Many women, they make covenants with God and they, they forget about it. God does not forget when you make a covenant with him, when you make a vow to him, God does not forget. A parent made a covenant with God, they forgot about it. My, my parent, my dad is said either I can become a military officer like his, uh, his father and uh, my mom, well, I, I can become a priest because in our family, we always give one son to be, a, in those days, to be a priest in each family. There is always one. Most of my cousins are Catholic priests. So that's the vow that they made. So no problem. So my parents raised me up, sent me to school and so on and so forth. Just like Joseph, he trained Jesus to be a carpenter. But you need to remember that those children are not truly your children. Children are a gift from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. So he gives you those children so that you can bring them up for him. And in the fullness of the time, he will come and take them so that they can enter into his destiny. And Hannah understood it. When the son was four and a half, she brought him to the house of Lord. She made the vow, the son of his vow, of, of, of her vow. So when now the Lord came and arrested me, with my mom, we did not talk for almost five years. We did not talk because she was she was saying I did not send him there to go and uh, become a pastor. The, there was so much tension with my mother. And then after five years, I was very very close to her with my mother. Very close. I was a uh, best friend. But because God, I used to say to God, God, you destroyed my relationship with my mother. You said you you want your family to be together, but now. I'm always at odds with my mom. Whenever we talk, there is always a uh, tension. I will not talk for more than uh, 15 minutes with my mom. Before we would talk for two hours, I would be on the phone with my mother. Because I accepted the ministry. And they are Christian, but uh, they did not want their son to be a pastor. They have not trained their son to be a pastor. And the uh, worst for worse, worse. My God also went and took my, uh, my younger brother in France also to be in the ministry. I used to say to God, God, listen, you've already spoiled my life. Don't spoil the life of my brothers, you know, and leave them alone. Let, if you want anyone to go for anything, send everything my direction. If you want me to sleep in the street, to do this, do everything to me, but leave my brothers alone. That's how I used to pray in those days. And God would just be laughing. And then the way God solved it, God appeared to my mother and God warned my mother. He said, they are not your sons. They are my sons. The book of Exodus, God said, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Let my people go that they may serve me. So God came and said to my mom, they are not your sons. They are my sons. I entrusted them to you so that you can raise them up. Now I've come to take my sons to do what I've called them to do. From that day, my mom <laughs> understood that uh, we were truly not her sons. We were God's son, first of all. She has done a job, she has educated us and with my dad and so on and so forth. Now she needs to turn us to our heavenly father to do the work of our heavenly father. The parents of, uh, how do you call him, Elisha, they were training him to take over the family farm. And he was a plowing, a plowing with the 12 oxen. The parents were happy. They did not know there was a call upon the life of that child. And the day came, Elijah came with the mantle and put it on uh, Elisha, follow me. But he went back. I said to God, I'm not going to preach until you solve the problem with my parents because they are not the pagans. They are Christians. 
but they are struggling with the call of God over the life of their children. So God sought them because even when Elijah, Elisha wanted to follow Elisha, I've explained that in the perfect redemption plan of God. Everything that I say is already written. So I'm not saying anything new. So Elisha, Elijah said to Elisha, what have I done to you? Go back to your people and settle matters. So Elisha went back to, uh, to his people. He talked to his parents. And then he took the oxen, the, the yoke uh, on the and one ox. He broke that needle, that, that those woods, burnt, uh, put uh, that uh, cow on, uh, cut that cow in pieces and put it on the altar, burnt it. And then he left everything and uh, followed uh, Elijah. Ask God, what has he called your children to be? So that when the Lord is calling them in the when they grow up, that you are not fighting with your children and fighting with God. So Hannah could release her son to God. Solomon also made a covenant with God. He was young in first uh, second Chronicles chapter one from uh, verse six to verse twelve. To be ordained as a king, you only need to give one offering of a bull. But Solomon was so excited, he, he knew that he was not the firstborn of David. He was among the last ones. But he was so grateful to God that, uh, that has chosen him over his brethren that he went ahead, sorry, and offered a thousand burnt offerings. Instead of one, he offered a thousand burnt offering. And God was so moved by uh, Solomon. And God cut a covenant with him. He, God came and asked him, what do you want? What do you want? God gave him a carte blanche. Choose whatever you would ask me. I'm so moved by what you did. Whatever you want, I will do that. What do you want, Solomon? Now, you, and many people would pray that prayer of Solomon. Have you moved the heart of God? Has God cut the covenant with you or pray that, that you are praying that prayer of Solomon? Solomon did something. He cut the covenant with God. He was a man, in those days before he fell into sexual immorality, he was a man after God's own heart. He was, he loved God so much that God gave him a nickname, Jedida, the beloved of the Lord. His father, David, David means beloved. But uh, Solomon, God gave him a nickname, Jedidah, the beloved of the Lord. He loved the Lord in those days so much that God was so pleased with him. And that's why God chose him over his brethren. And uh, he did what no other, even his father did not do that. When he was ordained the king, he gave a thousand bulls for, for offering instead of just one. And God came to him at night in the vision, said, what do you want? What do you want? And he asked for wisdom. And God said, yes, you need wisdom because you are young. But you also need money. You also need this. And God gave him also all the other things that he did not ask. When a man's way is to please the Lord, God will even make his enemies to be at peace. God will be the one saying to you that you also need this. You also need this. Add this, this, this. And God will give it to you, even what you did not ask for. It's called God knows the genuineness of your love for him. And uh, when Solomon built the temple, in uh, Second Chronicles chapter 7, he dedicated the temple. From verse 12 to verse 16, the Lord appeared to him. And he, he, he dedicated the temple and uh, made some proclamation. This, this is what you are going to do. If people pray towards this temple, heal them. Even if you try strangers, come towards this temple. Do this, do this, do this, do this. And God came to him to make a covenant with him as the one who built that the house. He said, everything that you prayed, I've heard you and I will do it. Even when your people are scattered all over the world, if my people were called by my name, they will humble themselves and they would uh, uh, turn from the wicked ways and they would pray. Then I would hear from heaven. I would forgive the iniquities. I would heal the land. I would bring them back to this land. And it is upon that covenant of Solomon that Daniel was praying. So when Daniel was in captivity, 
if the people, he opened his window towards Jerusalem because God said to Solomon, I have a covenant with you, the house that you have built. If people pray towards that, uh, that temple, they are going to have uh, the same, you are, I'm going to hear and I'm going to answer. And uh, so when Dave, Daniel was praying, he was praying standing on the covenant that God had with uh, Solomon in that uh, second Chronicles chapter seven. God said, I heard your, your prayer and I put my name on that house. Every church, the true church of God, God made some proclamation over that church. And God would operate with that church based on that covenant that he made with the, the one that he has asked to build that the church. In that case, it was Solomon. David did not build it. Solomon built it. And so Solomon prayed some prayer. God said, I've heard them, and so on and so forth. For instance, in the Mawitimi Bible studies, there are some prayers that uh, we did uh, with fasting always, that anyone that will be reading those Bible studies, like Paul says, I came to impart the, the word of God, the knowledge of the word of God, but also my life. Anyone that reads those uh, my weekly milk, what happens to them is that they have the, the knowledge of the word of God, of course, but they also start living in the holiness, of course. They also start having the spirit of a prayer. They just find themselves praying, having the desire to pray, 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 pray. Healing also started to, to, to follow them. They also start to manifest in the gift of the spirit. Effortlessly, they started to have visions and dreams. Whatever the Lord has been using us to operate in it directly imparted in those uh, material. That's what also John Gillick was doing. In those days, they, they did not have... Uh, what we have today, they only have pen and paper. So, but when John G. Lake was writing these letters, he was praying over them, it was functioning as a prayer cloth. And anyone that read it, they were baptized in the Holy Ghost, they were healed. And when he would send it even to Latin America, when people would read it, it would function exactly as the Lord covenanted with them. And sometimes I laugh. That's why I know when people are reading those my weekly milk. Last time it was the sister Rosemary that was supposed to preach. We did not discuss about what she was supposed to, to preach on. And uh, you know, I handled the prayer. And during the prayer, I uh, took some scriptures and I uh, prayed for some uh, for fear, against fear and so on. I did not know what Rosemary was about to preach. But when she started to preach, she addressed the same subject. And I was just laughing. It tells me already, because that's the covenant that I made with uh, the Lord in those Bibles. As people are also going to read, the same spirit that is operating is going to operate also in them. And we don't even need to communicate or to compare notes. The Holy Spirit would have the same thing. He would say the same thing to, to each one of us. And sometimes we sleep uh, the way we function, even my family. God would give us the same dream. My father was back home. My brother was in France. And me that time here, the same now we would have the same dream. Exactly the same thing we would see. Because that's how impartation worked. And even yesterday, I was uh, talking with, we were, after the healing crusade, we were talking with uh, Lynn and, uh, and Kelvin. And uh, they, they said, they texted me and said, the Lord told them, I think, uh, was it the beginning of this month or something like that, about my spiritual strife. But they did not know what it meant. So, but they did not discuss it with me. And, but the Lord told me also already in the beginning of January, what I'll be preaching, of uh, February, sorry, what I'll be preaching for the healing crusade, my spiritual strife with mankind. But we did not compare notes. And immediately, when I came, I preached and I explained. So they, I, I think I called them or they, uh, we exchanged the text messages and they told, said to me, but this is what the Lord said to us, but we did not know, now we understand. You will see it is the same Holy Spirit now that is uh, functioning in you because it is like now tuning folks. One is vibrating at this spirit, that, that is a spiritual frequency. The other one also is vibrating at the same spiritual frequency. And that's how it is. Uh, it functions those Bible studies, and there are so many other covenants that God makes with people in the building of churches, 
building of ministries, that's how it functions. May the Lord give us understanding of how the church functions and how we enter into covenant with uh, God. Well, if we take one of the redeemed Christian church of God, God gave them some uh, covenant back then, uh, 40 years ago. It had 28 points. And today, after, out of all the 28 points, how do you call it? Uh, uh, 27 already, God has answered them. So God, from the very beginning, tells you exactly what he's going to do. And the Bible said, of my weekly, we've told everything already that God is going to do. Why, why do I have that confidence to say? Because God cannot break his covenant. The only person who can sabotage it is Brother Jerry. If uh, I open those three doors in my life, sexual immoralities, uh, uh, heresies, uh, and uh, how do you call it? Um, idolatry and the window of fear. The only person who could sabotage himself was Eli, was a Samson, was uh, uh, David. But God would keep his word. My covenant I will not break, neither will I alter the word that has gone out of my mouth. Once I have sworn in my holiness, I will not lie to my servant David. David is dead. Now it is you. God, for instance, for money, he makes covenant with people. There are some companies that are here today. It is because God made a covenant with the fathers. The Heinz company, where you had your Heinz ketchup. The founder was a Christian. He was a Christian, and he decided to give a big part of his uh, profit to finance uh, uh, missionaries all over the world. That was his covenant with God. God, you bless this business. I will... Uh, always give money to pour money into the, 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 the mission. And God bless it to become the number one company in the world. I don't know if his grandchildren are still doing what uh, the, the father, the grandfather was doing in, in Heinz uh, company, but that's what the father did. The, the company that was Caterpillar, the founder was a Christian and Caterpillar had a covenant with God. He said to God, I would inverse the tithe. You give me what, uh, whatever profit I would have, I would give you 90% and I will keep uh, uh, 10%. And God made sure that Caterpillar became the number one uh, company all over the world. When, when you are talking about uh, equipment for construction, you'd always see Caterpillar, Caterpillar, Caterpillar. I don't know if uh, the grandchildren are still giving 90% to God and keeping 10%. I think they've changed. But for the sake of the covenant that uh, they had with the Father, God had with the Father, he kept on blessing. But God would test, like he tested Abraham. When we talk about, uh, for instance, uh, Reed of the Bible College in Swansea, God also had a covenant with him. He was giving 25% of uh, whatever God was giving to him. So God said to him, if you want me to be buying a building for, for Bible colleges, for orphanages, and so on and so forth, this is how we are going to do that. For every pound I give you, give me 25 cents. He did not start when he had a thousand pounds in his pocket. He started with when he had one cent. If you, the Bible says, the Bible is clear. If you cannot be found faithful with what is least, God cannot entrust you with what is much. Full stop. And I found it to be true. If you cannot give God one fish, if, you, if Jerry cannot close the church when the healing crusade is 200 people, do you think it is when God would give him a full stadium like he has already promised that I will be able to walk away from it if God said to shut it down? If I cannot obey one, there are only 200. Will I obey one, there are uh, uh, 100,000 uh, people in that stadium in Wembley or in the Celtic with 80,000 people? No. So God will test it in the beginning. If you cannot give me those 200 fish and close it when I'm asking you to close it when there are 200, it is not one that would be 80,000 in that stadium that you are going to close it if uh, it is not going the way you have commanded it to go. God is not interested. Uh, so stop making those kind of promises. God, when you give me 1 million, I will give you this. It does not work. God is not moved by that. 
If you cannot give him one ten p out of the one pound, God does not trust you. And Luke chapter 16, verse 11 to 15, if you cannot be found faithful with what is least, God does not trust you also with what is uh, much. So he did it with Reese. He did it with Mueller that had the orphanages, with uh, the, the ministry of, uh, how do you call it, um, uh, Benson Idaosa, God's when he only had $20, God said to him, I want to cause a lot of money to go through your hands. But for every $20 that I give you, I want you to give me $15 and you keep five. He went and talked to his wife. The wife said, over my dead body. We only have uh, five pounds of salary, uh, $5 of salary every month, and you want to give God uh, uh, $15 and you keep five? But he ignored his wife. He went to the drawers. He remembered someone gave him $20 in those days. He went to his drawers, took the $20, gave God 15 and kept the five. From that day, the Lord knew he meant business. And uh, 30 years later, when he was testifying, God had caused the $65 million to pass through his hand. Personally, not from the church, but through his hand to be a blessing to the body of Christ and to other churches. If God could not trust him with those at 15, uh, P, uh, 15 uh, pounds over for that uh, 20 pound note that he gave him, God could not trust him with much as well. The same thing for the house of prayer for all nations as well. There are some uh, covenants that we have with God. People say to us, why when you pray for finances, uh, people are, they receive the miracles. If your own obedience is not complete, then you cannot punish every disobedience. The pastor himself must obey the financial principle. So if the pastor himself is not obeying the financial principle, he can pray and fast for the church finances. <laughs> There will not be any money coming. That's why we don't uh, pressure people about money because we have a covenant. There is a certain percentage that I personally give to God. And when now I come to God in a place of prayer, I say, God, we need to be printing those uh, things. We need to go to Tanzania. I need money. I'm, I'm in a covenant with you. You need to supply. And I don't talk to anyone. I talk to God. And he supplies because we are in a covenant. And I will tell you what the Lord said concerning finances of the house of prayer for all nations and those who are in the house of prayer for all nations. The day is coming. That's what the Lord said last week. The day is coming that is going to raise not millionaires, but billionaires in the house of prayer for all nations. Those that because what the Lord is going to do for the 50 year European nation would cost you so much money. He sat me down, he said, Calculate. So I say, God, this is impossible. He said, That's not your problem, that's my problem. So I'm going to raise not just millionaires, I'm going to raise the billionaires in pounds. And they are going to advance the kingdom of God, those that would comply. So that's what I talk with God in my secret place and i'm telling you that because i'm so confident about confident about my god i always brag about my god he always keeps his word and the day will come mark my words you are going to see god is going to raise mighty people those that would comply with the lord if god cannot trust you with one pound he cannot trust you with more that's how simple it is but god is going to raise uh, billionaires in the house of prayer all nation that they are going to advance the kingdom like never before. We are never going to beg for anything. That's the financial co covenant that we have with God. And may God have a covenant with you as well. In the a personal covenant with you, a personal covenant with your church, wherever you are, whatever church you attend, a personal covenant for healing. He has covenant with us for healing. For instance, the Bible says God said to us, Hope found a great number of dead raising. The sixth day that you've seen raised uh, from the dead is just the tip of the iceberg. God is going to raise uh, so many dead people in the house of prayer for all nations. He said to us, hope fun, a great number of dead raising. 
So these are the, the sorry, it is written those Bible studies. So as you read those Bible, you will discover some of the personal prophecies that were spoken over the house of prayer for all nations. My prayer is that you are going to seek the face of the Lord, have a covenant with him concerning your business, concerning your family, concerning your marriage, concerning the, uh, your children, concerning your healing. God wants to cut the personal covenant with you. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. We want to give you all the glory and we want to give you all the praise. The entrance of your word gives light and understanding to the simple. Father, we pray for today. You want to cut a personal covenant with us? Father, I pray that uh, we will depart from uh, iniquity immediately because you are talking about bigger things. We cannot always be staying in our diapers forever. We are talking about uh, big things, big things. Because there is a kingdom to advance. Like uh, Michelle prayed, even with tears, that there is a kingdom to advance. We are so self-centered. Thank God for what you are giving unto us. But what you are thinking, you say the food that have been towards you, you have thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. I pray, my King and my Savior, that uh, we would uh, be like David, the man after your own heart that was willing to do all your will, that was obedient. We are going to be like Hannah. We are going to be like Ruth in marriage. We are going to be like Abraham that was willing to lay down his only begotten son. And because he did it, because he obeyed your voice, he also cut a covenant with him. I pray that we are going to have a personal covenant with you for our business, for the church, for our children, for our career, you are going to cut a personal covenant with us. And you are going to see to it. You are going to watch over your word to perform it in the name of Jesus. Me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. Thank you for those that desire to be married. Thank you for those that are believing you for the bone of the bone and the flesh of the flesh like the hoof that are saying, I just want to marry a Christian. Bless them. Honor the sacrifice. And grant them the boaz in the name of Jesus. Those that are like Anna, crying out for a child, give them more than a child. Give them children in the name of Jesus. Those that are in business, Father, I pray that you will remove the business from a welfare package and you would put it on the path to prosperity because you are the one who gives us the power to get wealth so that you may establish your covenant. And who has despised the days of humble beginning? Because though our beginning might be small, our family might be small, our church might be small yet, our business might be small, but our latter end shall be greatly increased. So increase us in every aspect of our life. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. May God bless you and keep you.